Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to season two of the Nakabi Diaries podcast, a platform dedicated to sharing the stories of the women behind the veil. This season, we will be speaking to more Muslim women from all walks of life as we continue to discuss their deep and intimate reasons for wearing the niqab, the niqabi diaries, our experiences, our perspectives, our voices. I'm your host, Samar, and thank you for listening. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Could you introduce yourself for us, inshallah, and let us know a bit about what you do, inshallah? <laughs> Naam. Okay, assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Khadija Maruf. I'm from Nigeria and I'm a mom of two, a business, uh, and a growing business entrepreneur. Or a, let me say a business woman, a business woman, and uh, as well a student in one of the universities here, actually, an undergraduate student in the computer science department. University of Ibadan specifically. I've said this before, uh, but Nigerian sisters never fail to, <laughs> to impress me. Thank you. Yeah, so you've mentioned that, okay, you're an entrepreneur, a mother of two, yeah. and yes, you're an undergrad, undergraduate student of or science, was it you said? Computer sciences. Computer sciences, subhanAllah. Okay, so uh, really, mashallah. See, everybody has the same 24 hours in the day, but Allahumma barik, Nigerian sisters, they maximize this 24 hours. <laughs> Thank you for the athletes. No. Sister, um, no. could you tell us about your Islamic background and, you know, how you came to be wearing the niqab? No, mashallah, alhamdulillah. I was so blessed to come from a background with a strong inclination of the deen. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. But nevertheless, at first I hated, I hated the niqab, subhanAllah. Mm. So I hated the niqab, you know, coming from a background with a strong inclination, you understand? So we feel we are kind of barbaric, we are not exposed, you know, I was so much in love with these Western words, you know, dressing official, um, like like an official um, appearances. I love it. I so much fall in love with them. So, in fact, at a point of time, you know, we we'll get to wear the kimar, and I feel embarrassed when I go. I was like, "Oh, this thing is just too long for God's sake." Mm -hmm. So I have to, you know, swap along the way. I stuck through life for those days. So we, we swap the corporate outfit during that time along the way. And, you know, but alhamdulillah. So what, I, what I'm trying to say this is that coming from a background with uh, a strong inclination doesn't really mean you're going to love the dean. Mm. Do you get me? Yeah, definitely. So there is this uh, camping program that we normally attend during the secondary school days. So... When, when we get to the camp at the particular year, that was like 15 years ago. So I came across some very young Nekobis, like under teen, teenagers, you know, on Nekob. Mm -hmm. And so my, my dad has always been the type, you know, that want, you know, that strong inclination of the teen in horse as well, mm -hmm. you know, because of these, uh, of these, you know, idea that, uh, I, I don't know how to put this, but despite the fact that, you know, our, our parents are trying so much to make us incline so much towards the deen, love the sunnah, you know, we, I still get to like, oh no, this is kind of barbaric for me, for myself. Mm. But alhamdulillah, the camping program is like a, an Islamic vacation course that is being organized by the Muslim Student Societies of Nigeria. So when I got back to the camp that particular year, so... I came across very young, vibrant, educated Nikobis, you know, and I don't know where this inspiration start coming, the love for the for the Nikob start to grow. So there is this particular sister. Uh, now she's she's a she's presently a PhD student now in the in the biochemistry department in one of the universities here. So she was such a beautiful inspiration for me. So I started studying her on camp. The camp lasted for 10 days, but you know, I just 
begin we are beginning to love the niqab through her mm. so on that day when i got home when the camp finished you know when i got home when i got back go back home so i just speak to one of my mom's niqab and i i used it and i started using it you know up and down just like a kind of test running yeah so the second day i see that i couldn't remove the niqab you know i started to get attached to heat mm -hmm. you know there was some there were some outings there i you know wear the niqab to the, to those outings mm -hmm. and i don't know that my my dad was observing me and oh uh, the, the fifth day i still remember the fifth day he called me i observed you you know you been attached to the niqab since few days ago mm -hmm. and it was like are you, you know, this is not so good. Are you going to stay with it or you want to remove it? You know, you know, doing the on and off thing is not so good. So, and subhanAllah, and I responded positively to him, which melted his heart. I said, oh, I want to start using it. Mm -hmm. No, that I, I don't even know. It was like kind of, you know, kind of divine inspiration. Mm -hmm. I told you that I want to start using the niqab and subhanAllah, his love for me grow extremely stronger. Mm. Then I was attending a public school and, you know, because of the niqab, you know, he was so excited that I could, you know, submit myself to the, to the, to the, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, spiritual dressing, you know, willingly at this a very tender age, I was 14 years that time so when I started on. using the niqab. So yeah. I was so, I was, I don't know what you call it. There may be the high school or the college, but we call it the secondary school. Yeah, yeah, the junior, school. I was even in the uh, junior secondary school then. I was in GS3 specifically. So I told my dad I wanted to start using the Nicole permanently. And mashallah, she, he promised me that uh, he's going to, you know, he's going to change my school to from public because in the public school, they're they not going to allow you to use the niqab in the, right. in the school. So I have to change to a private secondary school mm -hmm. then, you understand? And that was why I was part, I was privileged, you know, to be part, to attend a, to attend a private secondary school. Alhamdulillah, I used my niqab. So I started using the niqab and that was how the journey started. Although it was not easy, but Alhamdulillah, my parents, you know, uh, some as uh, people of understanding, you understand. So I don't have an issue with them. In fact, mm -hmm. the love was so stronger then, unlike before. So and, but you know, the family member mm -hmm. of them, uh, they were like, "Oh no, how could you? How could you put on the niqab for such younger age that has so many things to do in this life? You know, she's not going to be able to forward uh, to move on with education." She is going to kill her aspirations. It's going to this and that, you know. But alhamdulillah, Allah has been merciful. You know, when you have this uh, good intention and, you know, submitting fully, sincerely to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's definitely, you know, going to do, going to pave a way in every situation, in every endeavors. In fact, most of them, they, they went as far as like, you know, He's not going to see a very good husband, you know, he's not going to see a caring husband. And alhamdulillah, I married at the age of 21 to a, to, to a very loving and caring man. Polygyny, though, but I'm fine with it. Alhamdulillah. Nah. <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, mashallah, that's amazing. So, subhanallah. Wow. So, <laughs> mashallah, so you started wearing the neck up from the age of 14 and... Wow. So yes. you know, the school that you went to, the school that you changed to, this um, private school, was it an Islamic school? Yes, it was. It was. It was. Actually, I was the only one using the niqab there. Oh, well, I was kind of outspoken on yeah. and, you know, I tried to uh, to join them in, in some activities that they, they expect me to, you know, back out, like, you know, to isolate myself. Mm. I tried to feel among, so they love me. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> it was very. It was a very interesting journey. Alhamdulillah. So, what the what 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 region of um, Nigeria are you living? Ibadan, specifically. Okay. Ibadan. Okay. Like the southern part of Nigeria, okay. the southwest specifically. Mashallah. 
It's always interesting because obviously I speak to, I've spoken to quite a few Nigerian sisters as well. That's why I like to know which, I don't know anything about Nigeria, but I'd like, I'd like to know which kind of different areas just to see, like, get an idea of no. the, you know, where the Muslims are and the kind of Muslim communities you have in, in different places. I love my verdict. So, yes. Um, no. So um, when you, obviously you started wearing it from the age of 14, have you, did you ever experience any kind of abuse at any stage for wearing the niqab? Oh, there are so many things, so many experiences, so many words. But, you know, normally as a Muslim, uh, actually this southern part of the country, the Muslim is, is uh, the Muslims are plenty in numbers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those people with the pristine understanding of the team are very minimal. Alhamdulillah, they... You know the dawah is helping those days. You know, you know to spread the pristine understanding of of Islam among our people. Mm -hmm. Unlike the northern part of the country here, where we have, you know, when it is being dominated by more of Muslims. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So most of them have this kind of uh, kind of uh, barbaric barbaric ideology about people who cover the face you know they feel they are kind of local people they are people that are you know illiterate mm. they have so many so many you know painted negative ide idea about us but alhamdulillah when i started in a club you know at times when you go to some to some you know big companies big offices even at the bank you know they try to like you know no 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 excuse me they say, hey, 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 hey. you know this kind of kind of uh, kind of a physical assassination mm. you get me right yeah hey, hey. So at times some people will just go for so long and you would even wonder what exactly are they looking mm. are they looking at there was a time, in fact, I'll, we have a local language here. You know, some some of them always feel like uh, we don't really speak English mm -hmm. because we literate, you understand? So at times when you go out and speak English, they, you know, they look at you surprisingly like, oh, <laughs> you understand? Yeah. You know, at times when you try to like, to like go to some missed gatherings, you know, and, they, 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 you, you feel so hard, but alhamdulillah, you know, when you're someone that is, you know, outspoken and you don't care, you don't give a damn, so you're good to go. And coming, growing up, you know, I, that was when I was still young. I can remember a kind of case like that when I wanted to write my final exam in the secondary school. Mm -hmm. We call it the WAHEC, West African Examination Council. So that was one of the exams that we we're going to write to go into the mm -hmm. university. So while I was writing it then, we have we ha we always have series of invigilators that come to, you know, invigilate during the examination. And some of them, they would delay me. Like, you know, I can't allow somebody that, that couldn't, that couldn't, that couldn't open a face, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, does she appear like this on the passport? If she appears like this on the passport, then I'm going to allow her, you know, at times I have delay in my exam. And once in a while I used to, you know, I used to be favored to meet uh, those who are not uh, tribalistic and religious biased. Mm -hmm. They just understand, okay, well, that's her own inclination. And But in most cases, I used, I used to have these, uh, those that, these, uh, is, should I call them, uh, person, you know, uh, uh, they call the opposite of being pessimist. Those kind of people that have this, uh, is it pessimistic ideology? Yes. Yeah. I mean, they are against, they are against the anything Islam. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know. They don't, they don't care. You understand? Yeah. So I used to, I used to, I used to, I used to, I came across them during the examination period. In fact, there was a day uh, this a, a very strong Christian came to invigilate then I nearly lose the exam lose writing sitting for the for the paper but alhamdulillah at the end of the day it's it's, it's everything went fine alhamdulillah so and, and in addition to that why growing up I go on will you know after the marriage you know I go on will at times when you make a mistake along the traffic line you say who is it just that even give this one a car to be driving on the road you know all those some some people will 
tell you you are mad mm. and all sort of all, all, all sort of you know abusive word but you know you just have to take it as one of those things yeah, subhanallah wow so you know i you know i just want to pick up on something that you mentioned um you know just a while okay. ago which was that uh, when you mentioned about people look at you like you can't speak english and they're surprised when they hear you speaking english you know because this is something that a lot of sisters in the uk you know obviously we're living in the uk in, in a non-muslim country um and yeah. we experience that quite a lot here they assume that because you've got the knockout on that you're you're you know, you're foreign that you don't understand english or you don't speak it so it's kind of a little bit surprising to me that even in Nigeria, I know it's not 100% Muslim country, it's kind of 50-50, but people... The same still, everywhere. Everything is the same everywhere. Especially because, especially because, like, it's not only that, but I think just as Africans, something that I've noticed as well is that we seem to judge each other by our ability to speak English or not. It's like you measured somebody's level of intelligence. And other can I share a funny experience? Can I share a funny experience? Yes, go ahead. In fact, when you go to the marketplace, the feel because you wear the niqab, you 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 always you know uh, buy low things, low price mm -hmm. stuffs. Mm -hmm. You understand? At times when you price things are quite costly, they will tell you no, 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 no. You know, you, you can go for this one. I can remember recently, was it like two weeks ago? So I went to drop my car at the car wash, mm -hmm. and. I have to trek down to the class and along the way, the, the, you know, that particular path I used to, you know, go on wheel and this day I have to trek down because I've dropped my, I dropped my car at the car wash and there is this woman that's mm. by the roadside and she, 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 she shouted, who oh, they call us, some of them, they call us Ajia. When they see people on the cob, they call us Ajia, they, some call us Elena. So she was not like, Oh, Hajia, all this, these shoes are, are, are so cheap. You can buy them. And I feel like, what? So because I dress like this, then automatically I, I, I I'll always go for, you know, cheap things. Mm. And on days when I go on wheels. So that is another thing about our people here. You know, they, some of them, they, they love you. They can show love to you when, when they see that you live this lux, luxurious lifestyles. You understand, you go on wheels, you, you know, you, all this luxury, um, luxury stuff, luxurious stuff, you understand. Yeah. So they feel, oh, uh, they, 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 they give you respect more than those that are, you know, the struggling class, the anicobis. You understand? That's another mm -hmm. thing about our people here. And it's a very bad mentality. You know, if you pass through a place with a very fine Jeep, you know, in latest car, they will respect you. Oh, wow, you are so beautiful. But try to walk on your leg through the same path. Mm. You see the reaction is going to be so, so different. That is another oh, thing. God. I have some people that when I go there, on, when I pass through the place on wheel, they will, they will greet you very well. And maybe sometimes, some days the, the car is 40 or you know something happened and you have to track down and you see that those people, they behave otherwise. Mm. They don't respect you as much as you, you know, you pass to the side with luxurious, luxurious stuffs. You understand? Mm. So that's another thing. So sister, you mentioned the word before. You said they called you Ajia. They called sisters with an Aqab Ajia. What does yeah. that mean? Just like a kind of title, like Umu for... Okay. Okay. It comes from these uh, the northern is it's it's mostly used by the northern uh, northern women uh, northern men and women mm -hmm. or northern people generally to address um, uh, a woman a Muslim woman you know okay. I, I think they, they they got the name from those who attend the who have visited the Hajj. All oh, right. So you understand. Like, yeah, so yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. Hajj, like Hajj. Yeah, Hajj like, yeah. okay. Okay, exactly. So it's that kind of local title to given okay. to Muslim women here generally. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So would you, would you say that in your area where you've lived and in your experience, do you think that sisters who wear the hijab get a different treatment from sisters who wear the niqab then? 
yes, yes, there is. In fact, uh, even in the institutions, when Nico, mo, mo, most of the institutions here, Nicobis always have issue, except few, few of them. And uh, you know, you know, there is the, we have different sects among ourselves as a Muslim as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people hold to the opinion that, you know, the niqab is no wajib, mm -hmm. you understand? So, uh, there is this, this kind of issue that used to generate when the, when the niqab is attacked on campus or universities and other campuses like that, or any tertiary institution. So, so you know, we have some of these uh, uh, Muslims, but probably their own school of thought or the, the opinion they hold on the uh, niqab, they feel like, you know, this one is not necessary. You can just uh, uh, remove it for the sake of the education and, uh, you know, and there's no, no problem about that. And, you know, these are the people that you expect them to fight for your right, at least uh, for the sake of the, the, the shahada that we shared, for the sake of, you know, being a Muslim. But uh, I don't know, you know, they make, they, 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 they make, they make people see you has an extremist. Yeah. So yeah. even we among ourselves as a Muslim, due to in uh, different uh, different uh, difference in the sect and you know public school of thought and um, Islamic ideology, perhaps. So these people too are not uh, are not helping the situation. They make or uh, they make the Muslims or, or they, uh, sorry, they make the non-Muslims see you as an extremist. That's mm -hmm. that is one of the challenges. So we are. You know, at times, even when we have differences, when it gets to a point of, you know, uh, the Muslim versus non-Muslim kind of situation or circumstances, you expect that at least for the sake of Islam, even though you have a different opinion, you know that either we you support the niqab or you don't support the niqab, niqab is part of Islam, mm -hmm. you understand? Yeah. So at least you, you know, you expect them, you expect that, you know, for the sake of that, that they should, you know, help you to fight for the right, support you to fight for the right, but know it otherwise. In mm -hmm. fact, we, we even have some people among our, our Muslim brothers here who claim to be Muslim. You understand? Mm -hmm. Maybe perhaps they have a kind of different ideology. I don't know. So they'll, they'll tell you, you know, the, the Nekob is a culture, is a, is, a, is a culture of the Arab. You know, that is so sad. Okay, so at times, those people that you expect that they should, you know, support you to fight for the right of the Nakob, uh, those ones that are even standing against you, mm. you know, it's so, it's so mal. So they make the non-Muslims who we support to join hand together and defend the, the right of, uh, the right of being a Muslim, uh, you know, they make them see you as an extremist. Mm. So even... In our institutions, in some of the institutions here, yeah, even the Arabic and Islamic Studies Department, some of them don't succumb to this, uh, to this ideology of, you know, using the niqab. They see it as extremism. You know, it's, it's as that kind of bad. Let me say that. Subhanallah. So, on that note, would you describe the niqab as being a barrier? Oh, I can say it is, and it is not. Okay, so explain. It is okay. I'm going to explain. It's going. It is a barrier in the sense that it's it's it restricts you to some certain things. For example, uh, in some in some of our tertiary institutions here, we still have some you know departments and campuses that are at least allowing the niqab. You, you understand, but some department like medicine anything health sciences mm -hmm. medicines pharmacy even then even they are still struggling with the hijab nothing mm -hmm. you understand all the kind of courses so they are still struggling with the hijab they are still fighting it you know there are so many cases in the court mm -hmm. you know that they are still you know trying to resolve so you know <laughs> niqab is going to be a kind of exemption yeah. you know that kind of experience so uh except just a few of the some of our universities are allowing the niqab but they're not really much the struggle is still you know very very real and um it's not a barrier in the sense that at least we are 
we are privileged to, you know, we are privileged to some fundamental rights, unlike some countries like France, mm -hmm. where you have to even pay taxes because you wear the niqab, you understand, mm -hmm. you know, at least we drive freely. We have some countries that, you know, when you wear the niqab, you might not be able to drive, mm -hmm. you get it? Yeah. So, and uh, some national rights, like, you know, voting mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, at times, even now, when you go to the banks and uh, you want to do the biometric registration, the BBN, you know, they excuse you and or get a female for you to to attend to you. Mm -hmm. Unlike before, you understand. So yeah. things are now getting better, at least when you, like, for example, when I went to register my, um, my driver license, you know, in fact, I, I did not even tell the woman, I did not even request. They went to see me physically, they, they, they tell the, 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 the male officer to excuse us and a, a female officer attended to me, you understand? So, uh -huh. and, you know, just that in some cases, in some cases, in some organizations, they might restrict to you. You understand, but at uh -huh. least you can move freely in the market in some, even some big offices, Ex, uh, with few ex exemption, you understand, well, at least to an extent, you know, we have uh, different Nicobis here that are doing great in, you know, the field of medicine, mm -hmm. even though they did not, they didn't use it while on the campus, you know, while yeah. studying, but at least when they graduated, they were able to use the Nicob. We have pharmacists that are Nicobis, we have engineers that are Nicobis and doing uh, great in, in their various professions. So alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, so sister, have you done any traveling with the Nekar personally, like in, in Nigeria or outside of the country? Mm, no, I've not been outside the country, just traveling within. Okay, and how, how's that experience been? Uh, it was fine, it was fine. I can remember I, I traveled to the eastern part of a country. Okay. The eastern of this country is just like the America, you know, okay. the, with their ideologies, mm -hmm. you understand. So when you go there, they call you a masquerade. Oh, wow. <laughs> In their local language, it's called Ujuju. So when you when they see people, they, you know, even the way they will even be staring at you, you feel so kind of embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just pick yourself. I remember I traveled to, to one of those country some times ago and everyone kept saying I even I don't even understand what was happening until I realized oh I, I uh, they, they, they're not so familiar with you know people on the in the Nicob mm -hmm. in their community you understand mm -hmm. and some of them when you go on the streets there in fact later I have to just seclude myself to to the rest of the time I used in that particular community before I traveled back to my you know to my state so there they will be shouting, oh, Juju, oh, Juju, oh, Juju. That is masquerade. Wow. They will be shouting all those, you know, they've installed uh, this, that ideology into those young children. Even, even some of them that, that are living here, that travel, travel down here, you know, some of them that have settled here in my, in my state, mm -hmm. some of them, when, when you see them along the, along the street, they will, they will shout, oh, Juju. Some of, the, some, of the, some, of the, some of the kids, they even panic. <laughs> when they see you so now what i do is when i miss them like that and maybe the the kids start to cry or start shouting oh juju oh juju so i'll just say you know i'm beautiful just like like your mom i'll <laughs> tell the kid like <laughs> you understand so, yeah. and so so many experiences like that so alhamdulillah 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 so um have you met any sisters who really want to wear the niqab but they're not allowed to wear it Ah, yes, yes. In fact, when I just started the Nicob, I have some quite number of, you know, sisters that took up the, took up the Nicob as well because they feel inspired. You understand? Alhamdulillah. I also met some few sisters like that who were so interested, but, you know, the parents are not allowing them. Mm -hmm. And when they come here to me, I tell them to be patient. You understand? Yeah. And uh, I tell them to read more. Even aside, even those that, that the parent allow them, anybody that comes to me and show interest in the Nicob, I'll tell them to read 
more about it, you know, the, to expand the knowledge about the NACOB and uh, so that they understand the why, the, the why of them choosing to use the NACOB. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Yes. Uh -huh. So I used to advise them like that. And I used to tell them that, you know, they have to work on the personal self. You know, there are some things that, uh, there's some things that when you, when you do without the NACOB, people might not see you, people might not talk that much, but when you do it with the NACOB, they will definitely attach the signature on every NACOB that they come through. It's, it is, in fact, it's very, very common here. Mm -hmm. It's very, very common here. Maybe that is why I used to encourage sisters to be, you know, you know, we can't be perfect, but at least they should be, be good. They should be better. They always improve themselves because for example, when you go to a particular place and you messed up, definitely every thousands of Nicobis that, that visit uh, the same place, they will, they will have this kind of, you know, how mentality towards the person, even though she, she might not be like the person that they have experienced in, in the first instance, you understand? Mm -hmm. So I used to encourage the staff to be better and try to, you know, you know, get away with all the habits that they know they know themselves doesn't go along with the, you know, the the, the appearance of the, uh, the, the 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 physical appearance in the nikob. You understand me? Yes. So think her sister like that, and uh, and uh, and and if perhaps you know they still have challenges, I tell them maybe it's not a lot. It's, it's it's not the it's not a last time to. To, uh, but it's not, it's not yet the time destined for them mm -hmm. to be using the NACOB, that they should be patient. And, you know, you know, being patient with the parents is one of the things that will serve as dawa for them. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes. When you take it too personal with them and, you know, go against them, uh, you know, most of them, they just need explanations because they were not, they're unaware of, of what the NACOBs is really like, you know, because of the societal, uh, uh, the, the society, the societal, um, uh, what, what, what would I, what would I call the ideologies that is slightly yeah. as mm -hmm. imposed in them, yeah. you know, as, as put them with, you understand. Yeah. So they feel like, you know, if most people, they will feel like when you use the name call, you won't get a husband. So many times when people come across me and they feel like, ah, how do you now get your husband? They feel surprised that I was wearing a car before I Got met my husband. Yeah. You understand? So they feel surprised that so how how does your does your husband see you? How, how, you know, they don't know that. They can't comprehend or even get to know that you can you can find a good husband, even despite being the Nicob. So that is one of the fear of those parents that, you know, when you use the NICOP, you won't be able to see a good husband. You won't be able to, you know, uh, further your education. You will just be thinking about the NECA, the NECA, the NECA. And from there, all your aspirations is going to be dead. You understand? Oh, so I think, <laughs> no, no, no. so I encourage sister to be patient and, you know, strive to be better strive to be better so that we are going to prove them wrong you understand inshallah yeah definitely subhanallah so have you met any sisters who've been forced to wear the nakal yes i have okay it doesn't last yes i have but most of those sisters they don't wear it for long okay because because they don't really understand they use the nakal under pressure I, I mean being forced because Actually, in my part of, uh, in in the in in my in my state here, yeah. I mean the region where I am here, so we have some uh, this trad uh, local local stars, local imams, you know. So some of them know that they have that kind of strong um, understanding of the Islam, but you know. I don't know how I'm going to explain it for better understanding. Their inclination is is not is not pristine enough. Mm. You understand? You know, maybe probably when they when uh, Islam was just introduced in those holding days, so most of them they just practice the Islam according to their little understanding. Mm -hmm. You understand? 
so most of them they have the strong in the body they understand the nikop perfect uh, perfectly for example there is this set of people we call them the makondoros mm -hmm. so those people know that they alhamdulillah they are trying but know that they are practicing the pristine islam like that mm -hmm. but they have a strong um a strong inclination towards the practice of the nikop that it is a must for you to for you to to use the nikop when you come out from those you know when you are when you have the your terbia mm. among those set of people so they have to in fact they will organize parties because you want to use the nikop wow. they they take it as a special celebration mm. you understand so what i'm now saying in the essence is that most of those people that are forced to wear the nikop most of them they had this you know they are these street girls. Okay. You understand what I mean? Oh, you know, so, so basically the, that, that culture that you mentioned, they, they feel they're not personally kind of forced by their parents. Is it kind of a societal pressure then? Because that's what the people, that's what they believe that you're supposed to do when they get to a particular age? No, no. Those those kind of people just just have a kind of, they are, they are like sect. Right. You understand? So they are like sect. So they have a special inclination you know these people they don't have observed the for sack for example but they have a very strong inclination towards the nikop you understand yeah. so those people they, they they even though they don't practice some of the sunnas in some aspects you know but this aspect of the nikop they always enforce the you know that women folks to use the nikop that they organize parties uh you know and all sort of things although it's not part of the sunna but maybe it's kind of the in the holidays mm -hmm. you understand when the islam was introduced to them we call them the makondorus mm -hmm. so uh, there are some we call them the bamideles the bamideles so those ones too so they they used to enforce their women folks to use the nikob mm -hmm. so so most of and most of these uh most of these uh female Know that they understand the nikob like that. Know that know that they have a sound education about the nikob. No, they just see it as a kind of a kind of pillar in their own ideology of Islam. You understand? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so and uh, it's not so good enough because most of them they practice they practice uh, so many dirty atrocities uh, cities. Uh, atrocities. I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> atrocities with the nikob. I'm sorry for that. Yeah. So, so like some of them, you find them in the hotels with non mahram You, you, you see them with a lot of dirty behaviors, mm. dirty actions that they do in the street, and which is always affecting people like myself and other amazing sisters. You understand? But alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Now. Uh, things are getting better because everyone now gets to understand that when you do something bad, you represent yourself. You mm -hmm. don't represent everyone. You understand? Yeah, so people are getting to understand that. In fact, most of them to know that they know they are, is, is they just do it out of pressure. Not that it's because they are educated. When they get to celebrations, they, some of them unveil. Subhanallah. You understand? Even yeah. even in front of non mahro you understand yeah. you just go to anywhere they don't even understand the ethics that goes in line with with the nikob they don't understand the etiquette of using the nikob you understand so uh, alhamdulillah things are getting better at least so um sister like what would you say the nikob means to you mm. To me, Nikob is a precious shield. Okay. Can you get me? Yes. Yeah. It's a precious shield because it makes you re uh, reserved. It makes you reserved and it, 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 it enhances the honor. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that we still have, you know, the struggle of some people having this negative mindset towards the Nekobis. So when you see some people that even they are non-Muslim, but they understand the this freedom of religious practice of individual. You understand we have some people like that. They may be non-Muslim, 
but they will respect you for whatever inclinations, religious inclination you choose. To, you understand? Mm -hmm. We have some people like that. So when they respect you, it's melt your heart that you don't even think about those people that have said negative things about you, that have aroused you, that have embarrassed you, you understand? So they respect you like, in fact, at times when you go out, you know, some of them feel like, oh, like I said, I used to call us Hajia. So they will tell you, ah, Hajia, ah, no, no, no. There was a time I went to the ATM machine. Can you get me? Yeah. And so that was the time I went to the ATM machine and I met this man. He is not a Muslim, but it, when I got there, it was like, no, Haji, you know, you know, go use the the, the, the ATM first. You understand? I, I felt so respected. I felt honored. Mm -hmm. You understand? So they asked if, in fact, if, in fact, there are some people that when you go on public transport, they when they see you in the cup, they pay your transport. Really? They pay your transport. Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> So there are, although there are some, you know, horrible experiences, but there are, there are, there are interesting experiences too. Mm -hmm. okay. And there was a time I, I, I was inside a bus and a, a public bus and a man at, at my back was like, I, I have the school bag, school bag on me. And uh, he was like, oh, excuse me, do you wait people to go to school? I, I, I picked a call that particular moment and mm -hmm. I have to speak in English with my caller. So mm -hmm. he was not surprised. He was like, oh, that's so beautiful view. Oh, I'm so impressed. You understand? Yeah. At times when you go mm -hmm. outside, when some people, they will, they will thumb up for you. And you know, you feel, <laughs> you feel so, uh, you know, so honored and you feel proud of yourself. You understand? So it's, 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 it's a kind of, it's, it's a kind of, uh, is a signal of respect and honor. It's a signal of respect and honor when you practice practice it the way you are supposed to, uh, you know, to do it. And when you do it sincerely, you you don't have to be scared about what is going to what is coming. You understand when you do it sincerely, you don't have to be scared about oh, how will I get go about this? How will I how will I go about this? Okay, I might face these challenges. You know, we don't be scared of any challenge that comes uh, that comes. Uh, along the line, you understand. So, yeah. alhamdulillah, despite it was rough and um, everything is almost a history. Mashallah. So, um, sister, you mentioned in the beginning that you're actually an entrepreneur. So, what is your business about? Uh, I am into logistics. I have a small logistics company. Okay. Mashallah. And, uh, and uh, I sell honey. Really? In what is yes original honey? Do you have your own beehives? No, no. I collect it in big, in, in larger quantity from those that have the hives. So okay. I collect it for them, and I sell in warehouses and the retail uh, prices to the to clients. And I also sell. We call it meat jerky. So in in Hausa language, they call it kilishi. It's it, it like a kind of dried grilled meat okay so i yes, sell yes. Mm -hmm. i sell to the supermarket i i sell to you know to big stores as well i supply for them so and uh alhamdulillah it's been interesting and recently recently mm -hmm. i started advocacy about polygyny so really? you know i'm Yes, you know, I'm a second wife of four wives. <laughs> wow. So can you tell us a little bit about that then, inshallah? If you get you say? can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Okay, so uh, I can see that you know polygyny is something that is always had for our women folks. Mm -hmm. You know, we are always being emotional whenever we hear the word polygyny, and uh, you know, I just feel uh, you know, a lot of people think when you are in polygyny, especially when you have been married upon, you know, the love is going to be definitely dead in your marriage. Mm -hmm. You, Your husband is not going to love you anymore. And uh, there's this kind of inferiority complex that, you know, most subsequent wives deals with that probably there are second mm -hmm. options and the likes. So I started this advocacy, you know, being what I've been through and alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine. Uh, so I, I started this to help uh, women to you know thrive well despite in a polygynous marriage so alhamdulillah it's been a very interesting thing you know 
you know, I see it as an opportunity to educate people too, who I, especially the single sisters who might be, who might uh, find this, themselves in polygyny marriage, mm -hmm. you know, so that they won't, they're not going to make some mistakes that some people have made and regretting, you know, being in polygyny bitterly. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. So, alhamdulillah, I started some time ago and it's, it's doing well. So, and I'm planning to, you know, get a certified, um, certified, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to go for a certification course about the um, uh, emotional intelligence courses, something like that. Okay. You understand? Okay. That sounds good. Uh -huh. so, that, so that I can be more professional about that. Do you understand? You know, you know because I'm just, it's, it's just like I'm using a gifting talent uh -huh. presently. So... I want to, I, I hope very soon that I become a certified counselor, a certified emotional in, uh, intelligence specialist, inshallah, so that I can inshallah. help people to you know, stabilize themselves and, you know, maximize uh, the marriage and fulfill their marriage aspirations, even despite being married or porno, despite being in polygyny. Inshallah. May Allah make it easy for you in your endeavors. I mean, sounds amazing. So I'm quite interested in like this whole kind of subject because I mean, often I find that um, when I've spoken to a lot of Nigerian sisters in particular, if they're not in polygyny themselves, is something that they know somebody who's you know in a polygynous marriage is, is something that's quite common in the muslim community and i know even i think even non-muslims still some places they do it in you know west african countries anyway but it's just interesting yeah. because it's something that is still part of the exactly. culture and it's still it's still a cultural norm and um sometimes people exactly. um you know western muslims like do try to sometimes implement yeah, it yeah. and some are successful and some really aren't and i think it's partly because of maybe the way that they perceive the polygyny as well because i think sometimes yeah. there's like maybe an imbalance with how the men are seeing it and they maybe they're seeing it is uh, from their point of view that something is supposed to be more advantageous to them and um, yeah. and some and the women as well on the same on the other side that some women feel that it's something to their detriment because you know you're having to share your husband you know and obviously like there yes, were issues yes. of jealousy and these things even in the sunnah the prophet you know yeah. he, he made dua for i think it was um um salama that you know that Allah would, you know, yeah. jealousy yeah. from her so that, you know, when he married her also that exactly, you know, exactly, she, exactly. Yes, yeah, exactly. so obviously, like there is, there's always going to be issues of jealousy, um, you know, for women, but, and this uh, is something normal, exactly. but I think that definitely polygyny is something that can be yeah. done successfully when the man understands what it is about exactly. and he, he exactly. fulfills the duties exactly. towards the wives, you know, he doesn't think about exactly. it as something that is just for his own personal benefit, subhanAllah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Oh. Alhamdulillah, we have some great number of sisters, you know, that are trying to change the narratives. Mm -hmm. And I think the awareness is growing. And my own uh, advocacy also is just a little way of, you know, contributing to the to the to the education to the growth of you know educating people about polygyny to not making it, make it like a nightmare for our women first so have the lamia lasted fast also yeah i mean i mean no i definitely think it's a great idea maybe we can inshallah have a a talk another time specifically about your advocacy that you're doing and you know just to raise some more awareness inshallah i think it will be very beneficial no problem. Inshallah. No problem, inshallah. inshallah. It's, um, it's, been, it's been an amazing moment with you. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, really, I've enjoyed our conversation, sister. I'm so glad <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I got to this chance to speak with you. Mashallah, mashallah, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Was I I and have, a, have a blessed evening, inshallah. I mean, and, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you too. Naam, naam. Mashallah. Barakallahu feekum. <laughs> Barakallahu sister. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Naam.